What's the haps? I'm John, aka Maroka, and welcome to Spiral Spiel! We find ourselves this week in the... Uh, Copper Titan Gate? Question mark? Copper Bishop, that's the one. Copper Bishop Gate, which is... Uh, beasts! I... No, I said recently, I've done too many beasts recently, but there's a chance of getting the jelly farms, and jelly farms are awesome, yo! I want to do jelly farms. We should just have jelly farms all day long. I'd be happy with jelly farms all day long. Let's do that. Let's do jelly farms. Let's farm the jelly. I'm okay with that. Hey, isn't isn't Nick Popovich doing a game about that? I believe he is. Yes, yes he is. The guy who made this game, his next game is a game about farming jellies. Or slimes, at the very least. I think that guy really, really likes slimes stroke jellies. Either or. A little of both. They can be both. They can be either. I don't know. It's a weird taste to have, but he has it. Anyway, let, let's talk news. Let's do some Spiral Nights news. Yeah. This is news that I think some people thought I should have been a bit more prominent about. I should have made a video about. Uh, it was clearly so, so unprominent that it managed to slip under my radar until somebody actually told me it was happening two days later. Which is Apocrya is back. Apocrya is back on our radar, so... Uh, if I go into the, not the rank missions, the prestige missions, we have, ooh, look, Shroud of the Apocrya is back, ooh, spooky. Uh, you know what's not spooky? The fact that it is exactly the same as last time. Yeah, that's a pretty compelling reason for me not to cover it again. I've made three videos on Apocrya now, and they're still relevant, because it hasn't changed. Last time they... was it last time or was it the time before? I think it was last time. Last time they added some cosmetics. Which at least was like, hey, there's one new thing in here for people who want to grind way more than is necessary or healthy for a human being to be grinding. But it was there. This time, there doesn't appear to be anything. It's, it's the same as before. If you have the obsidian weapons... Congratulations, you don't need to be involved in this again, unless you really, 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 really want tentacle nipples. Tentacle nipples are available to those who want to grind for tentacle nipples. I do not rate the tentacle nipples personally, and I shall be avoiding such things. Hey look, it's a toilet drone! Oh my god, scenario room. This is one of the less, oh my god, scenario rooms. It's more just sort of, oh, that's, that's, it's subtle. It's a subtle scenario room. Yay, subtlety. So, yeah, I'm not going to be doing any videos on Apocrya. You are hereby notified that it's there. If you have not got all the things you wanted from, from the last three times around, or are new to the game, welcome to the game, then, yeah, you can go get those. Those are fun toys. You should go add them to your repertoire. I never use any of them myself, but they're fun toys. As a lot of people do rate them, so, yeah. If you heat them up, I guess they're probably pretty good. The obsidian blade, sword, whatever it is, whatever the actual term for it is, is very, very similar to the Acheron, so... It, it's nice in that regard. It's less powerful, but deals poison effects as well, so... I uh, need a little alternative option for you there. So, that's cool, that's cool. Uh, the gun is, again, similar to, similar to your Sentenza, but with poison. And your crusher is similar to the Graviton Vortex, but with poison. Are you seeing a recurring theme there? Yeah, you are. So, if, you, if you're intrigued by those weapons, go get them. Everyone else, keep doing what you're doing. There is little for you to be found, except expensive, very, very expensive cosmetics. I suppose this does come with prize boxes. We should probably have a look at the prize boxes. We go to the purchase. Uh, look, we still got the peridot, peridot, whatever. We never did decide what that was. I think it was both. Um, and we still don't. Oh, are they not doing the? I I may have made a, a false assumption here. I'd assumed Apocria came with the Apocrian prize boxes, so that you could find, so that you could buy yourself some Apocrian accessories. Uh, that does actually isn't there. Oh 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 my. Uh, although I did spot uh, where we're looking specials. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, you can buy these if you want to. Oh, there it is! Ah, ta-da! I'm looking in the wrong place, that's what I'm doing. You buy it with energy. You can buy it for 2,600 600 energy. If you have energy burning a hole in your pockets... I kind of do... I'm not I'm not dropping that much on an Obsidian prize box, no. I don't think the odds are... The odds are not in my favour. But, yeah, if you've got a lot of energy burning a hole in your pockets... Yeah, you, 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 could, you, could, you could buy that. I don't know, I guess, maybe. That's cool, whatever. It's your money. 
Anyway, let's do questions. Let us do all the questions. That is the news. The news is underwhelming, frankly. So, let's, let's move on to the things that you have asked. I had a few left from last week and we got lots of new ones, or at least a few new ones. So, let us uh, work our way through them. Uh, what have we got from... Let's see. I think this is one, yeah, this is one I wanted to talk about last week, which was from Lemon Lime Minties, who says, Hello! Hello, Lemon Lime Min Minties. I have a question for Spiral Spiel, they go on to say. What do you think of Gaia Hypothesis? How plausible of a theory, theory is it? I don't believe it, but what are your views? I also really don't hold much store by it. I've not heard any particularly compelling scientific evidence. Gaia Theory obviously being kind of the theory that all life on this planet is kind of interconnected, is like in one kind of giant living symbiotic biomass thing. Every, every every living thing is connected to every other living thing, and we operate as a whole, one single Gaia! Which is obviously something that's been toyed around with in science fiction works and whatnot and stuff. Uh, it's certainly interesting, but I, I think it... I, I don't even think it goes as far as theory. Calling it a theory is generous. A theory has evidence to support it, but hasn't been proven. I'm not even aware of any evidence to support this. It's a hypothesis is, hey, this is this idea. It needs some testing to find out whether it's even likely. A theory is when you've got some evidence to support it, and it becomes a law when it's like irrefutable concrete fact. Because you can't, you know, you can't mathematically prove like evolution. It's the theory of ev evolution. I don't think it, I don't think there's any way it can be the law of evolution. I don't think that can happen. But because you can mathematically prove like gravity, you get the laws of gravity. These are the distinctions. Uh, for something that people are like, Hey, how about if this was the way that things worked? We haven't got evidence for it, but we think that that's probably a pretty good way that it might work. That's a hypothesis. Yeah, it ain't a theory, and it's... I, 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 I looked into it a little bit, and I couldn't, still couldn't find any particularly compelling evidence. It was just like, yeah, it's, a, it, it's an idea that people have. So that seems to be about as much as this could be said for it. I did happen to stumble across the Wikipedia page went on to link to. There's also the Medea hypothesis, which is kind of the polar opposite of it and amused me greatly. Are we in a jelly? I didn't, I didn't make a note of the gate. Is this a jelly farm? I think it, it, it might, might, might be a jelly farm. It's not a jelly farm, is it? It's the low gardens. God damn it, why is it always the low gardens? It's not. I should know a jelly farm when I see one. This is not jellies. Dang it, dang it, dang it, dang it. I could have hung around for like five minutes and waited for it, but... I don't want to do that. Ain't nobody got time for jellies. Except for Nick Popovich, who has way, way too much time for jellies in his life. I... I don't even know. I don't even know. That man and jellies. I got a problem. Uh, yeah, the Medea hypothesis. The Medea hypothesis is kind of, yeah, as I say, the polar opposite, which is basically... Not that all life works together as some kind of symbiotic whole, benefiting the planet and ultimately being a, you know, good thing is generally kind of where Gaia goes with that. Uh, the Medea one is that basically all life is inherently damaging to a planet, one way or another. Is there? Oh, I have a, uh, I have a jar. I was just wondering how I could get in there. We can get in there like that. Cool. Uh, so yeah, that's basically if you kind of look back through the historical record, you see that not all, but uh, quite a lot of widespread extinction events uh, caused by some manner of life form somewhere on the planet. Obviously not stuff like, you know, asteroid impacts. That's, yeah, no, no, no creature created an asteroid impact. Unless we were really, really, really wrong about the dinosaurs. <laughs> it was like, no, they are, they are actually far more advanced than us and had the ability to control space rocks, but a war between the different factions of the dinosaurs, a war between the carnivores and herbivores, caused one of them to smash an asteroid into the planet in an attempt to kill off the others, but inadvertently doomed all dinosaurs. I don't know. I'm making things up here. I also feel like I, I'm pretty sure I stole that idea from Saturday Morning Breakfast Cereal. Well, I, no. Not directly, but I'm pretty sure I'm embellishing on an established idea that he came up with at one stage. Uh, yeah. So, no, I don't think that's the case. Uh, but if you look at stuff like... Uh, is it cyanobacteria, I think is the name for the proper name for it? Uh, the, basically, the, the, the microbial organisms that ultimately... ultimately produced all the oxygen on the planet which allowed us to be here in the first instance. 
uh, changing the atmosphere in such a dramatic way at that time killed off quite a lot of life on the planets. Quite a lot. So that was a mass extinction event. That's a fairly noteworthy mass extinction event that was brought about by an organism on a planet. Uh, that's not to say... Um, <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. Where was I going with that? Give me some ideas, guys. Uh, I think I... I think we've covered kind of humanity's impact enough over the course of the last, uh, well, entire series, pretty much. Uh, so I'm not going to get into too much about how humans are going to destroy the planet, but we probably are. If you want to cause, ma I mean, even if even if we don't destroy the planet, you know, we're talking sort of mass extinctions. Whatever impact we have on the planet, chances are it's going to be enough to destroy ecosystems and wipe out species. As much as we might like to fight, as much as we will try to counter it as best we can. Uh, we may be in many ways successful, we, at some point we might be able to counteract some of the effects. I don't think... There's, what, what am I grabbing? That's what I'm grabbing. I don't know why I'm grabbing that, but I'm grabbing it. I think I thought I was missing the health pill, that's why I made room for that, but whoops. Whoopsie. Uh, so yeah, even if we counteract some of the effects of climate change and whatnot, ultimately we're going to wipe out a lot of species, and already have, so we are still already pretty harmful to the planet, even if you just want to, you know, Look at stuff like the poor old dodo, for example. Yeah, whoops. They were tasty. And I can't re I can't remember the exact details. I would have to go back and troll like QI for it. I, I there's a fantastic story about a species of turtle. I think from the God, is it Gal Galapagos Islands somewhere? Ooh, big coin. Uh, somewhere like that. Basically, the age of exploration and the new world and whatnot. We went out and found and discovered this new species of, of turtle or tortoise or one of the two. I don't know. Something with a shell. And basically, I, I'm not sure exactly how they discovered it, but they discovered it was so delicious that they ate every single one and they couldn't, for the life of them, resist at all managing to put, bring one back and keep it in ca captivity and you know keep keep at least one member of the species alive every time they put a tortoise on the ship they, they they couldn't get it back across the ocean without going you know what i have already had dinner but just one this way it, 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 it won't it, it won't hurt me just to have have one 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 tortoise you know one tortoise it, it, it's, it's not like he's going to wipe out the species is it it's just to eat one tortoise Oh, just go on. We, we can always go back for more. There's, there's more tortoises on there. Let's, let's have a nib nibble of tortoise. And uh, they they did that a lot. And whoops! Ultimately, no more tortoise. So yay! That's that's um. I I, I think the Medea hypothesis has more grounding. It seems like that actually. You know, some, you can hold that 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 holds some water. That theory. Yeah, I'll go with that. We are all life forms are inherently huge. You know, negative, detrimental, harmful to the well-being of a planet. If such a planet could be described as having a well-being, I suppose. Yep, not good. So that was fun. I am Phoenix with the many questions. Always with the many questions from I am Phoenix. Uh, can computers keep getting faster? What, like indefinitely, forever? Uh, I imagine there's kind of a point at which it's probably got a plateau. I think at the minute, certainly. I. Th Thing, I, I would argue that at the moment with most computing it seems to be uh, I feel there is far too more em too much of an emphasis on portability and mobility and mo tablets mobile devices that kind of thing wearables that are basically sacrificing power in exchange for in many cases gimmicky kind of doodads and yeah it's the computers that people are going around with these days, when you look at stuff like tablets, are like significantly inferior to, you know, like the regular computers. Well, I wouldn't say not significantly, they're kind of catching up, but they're, they're, they're like behind sort of, you know, desktops or laptops or whatever. And even laptops are kind of, I suppose, in many ways, sort of partially responsible for that, but I think if, if, you, if, if technology was driving just towards making things more powerful, yeah, they'd keep getting better a lot faster. As it is, you end up with stuff like Windows 10, which is like... Is it better, or are you just trying to make my desktop computer into a tablet computer? Because I don't want to do that. That's not what I want to do with my computer. It's... Is this better? I mean, yeah, yeah stuff, stuff like DirectX 12 is... Inarguably better, I suppose. But... Uh, kind of not sold on the interface and the... Hey, let's make everything into a mobile phone! 
which is inferior to everything. I mean, and don't get me wrong, it's a fantastically useful device, and I love having my phone and having access to the information superhighway at my fingertips, at my beck and call at any time. But, as I say, for a lot of people, this is kind of their primary, primary computing. It's like, the kind of tower and monitor kind of setup is kind of fallen by the wayside, and one's got to wonder, like, is it, how much market share for desktop computing would you need to lose before people just stop really caring about it. I mean, I'm not saying, oh, it's the death of PC gaming here or anything. I don't, I don't, I don't genuinely think that's the case, but eh, one's got to wonder. One, one does indeed have to wonder. So, yeah. Uh, what else we got? We have got, what is at the bottom of the ocean? 95% is unexplored. Do you think it's worth the cost to explore it? I, uh, well, um, well, you know, I'm more of a spaceman, but yeah, I, it's, it's kind of it's kind of one of those things where it's like that that requires some probably some pretty expensive equipment, but then so does space. So uh, I, I guess either's good. Uh, I've, I've referred to a series a, a a series of novels in the past. The the um, Poseidon's Children. That's what it's called. I can never remember. None of the books refer to the series as that, so I, I can never remember what it's called. But yeah, Poseidon's Children is by Alistair Reynolds and deals with the near-ish future of humanity over the next course of a couple hundred years. I think it's got some interesting and relevant ideas to humanity. And it deals with, as I mentioned before, the resource and relocation crises of the 21st century, which I think could very well be a real thing if one would sort of to extrapolate from where we are to where we're going. And ultimately, I, th I believe uh, a, a, big, a major part of the solution to these crises w within the books is the fact that quite a lot of a, a lot of humanity becomes aquatic. Basically, there's just like entire entire cities underwater, and humanity, I guess, kind of genetically modifies themselves in many ways to adapt to underwater life. And a lot of people are just like, yeah, they're they're, they're a lot of people are basically fish. In, the, in that series. Now we ain't got technology like that, and we don't need anything like that, but the idea of, hey, overpopulation and stuff like that, we got an ocean, why don't we use it for something? I, I can get behind that idea. I kind of dig the idea of an underwater city. Maybe just because I played Bioshock and Rapture was friggin' awesome, but that's it's certainly an idea I can get behind. There's useful space. We should, we should, we should make good use of these space. Yes, let's do that. Uh, what else we got? Oh, and... Thoughts and ideas on the banak tarski paradox. Will it solve our problems, or is it too absurd in complexity to be viable? I... Looked this up, because I'd never heard of this before. I did look this up. It's some weird mathematical, really sort of... Deep mathematical, more advanced... I Look, I, I did A-level mathematics. And A-level further mathematics at school. I ain't heard of this. This is beyond my level. You're, this is at least degree level. This is at least an undergraduate degree level mathematics that you're talking about here. Bare minimum. I can only presume unless, you know, other schooling systems teach wildly different mathematics to what the heck I learned, but it could be the case. That could be the case indeed. But, yeah, I, I ain't heard of this. Basically, some weird mathematical formula that proves that if you take if you take a sphere and divide it into a finite number of parts, you can rearrange those parts and create two new spheres of exactly the same size as the original. And it can also be used to create, like, multiple, sp multiple spheres with a greater volume than the original and stuff. I think the, I think the volume thing is the core part of it. It's, it's, you are basically creating more volume from the same surface area. Um, I don't understand what's going on with any of those formulae. I, you know, that's way beyond me, and it's it's one of those things that sounds like that's wildly implausible, and I'm pretty sure it's the only... I don't, I don't think there's kind of any practical applications to that that I'm aware of. I'm guessing the practical applications that we're going for there are kind of, yeah, making more things out of war, and it's like, okay, we can take an object, I don't know, let's say take food and cut it up into a finite number of parts and turn it into two foods and therefore we have solved the food pro problem. I'm like, nah, nah, that's kinda, no. 
just know. Basically, you're... That, that would, you're creating matter, though. It's, it's like a matter replicator, and you're basically creating matter out of nothing. It's, I'm sure it works fine in the realm of mathematics. From what I know of physics, I'm pretty sure that's fundamentally at odds with the laws of the universe. Yeah, I don't think that works. Uh, and I and I still don't understand it, like, particularly at all. It's just weird. Go look that one up if you want to be confused. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Captain Walkin, a name I haven't seen in a while. Hello, Captain Walkin, welcome back. Uh, any movies that have ever impressed you on a technical level with special effects and so on? What movie and what was so impressive? I'm not a movie person. I'm really not. So, it's not something I've ever really given any great consideration to. There's... The only thing that really springs to mind is something that I, I haven't even seen the movie of. I've just seen the scene that was impressive because it was on like some evening top 100 dross that Channel 4 put out at some point. The sort of thing that they do because they like making that kind of content. Probably because it's fairly easy con content to make, which is why so many YouTubers make that kind of content. The top 10 some things that I looked up on Wikipedia. And uh, Channel 4 loves that kind of content. Or did, I don't know, I haven't watched TV in a while, really, if I'm honest. I presume they still make those kind of things. The low-hanging fruit of documentaries and TV shows is the top 100 things of vague, mild interest presented to you by a handful of B-list celebrities. Yes. And I'm sure one of them I watched while bored one day was Something about, you know, special effects in movies and things. It was like, oh, top 100 special effects. And the, clearly most of them were fairly unimpressive because I don't remember most of them. But there's one that's always kind of stuck with me as being like, holy crap, that was like really, really good. Which is, there's a scene in Swordfish, which I guess if you've seen Swordfish, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you haven't seen Swordfish, uh, there is a kind of an, there is an explosion, there's some people running through a crowd, police scenery are all over the place, and a huge, huge explosion goes off, and the camera goes slow-mo and kind of dollies around the entire scene, which in and of itself is not crazy. Dollies have been around in cinema for for many, many a year. It's basically when you put the camera on a rail and move it around to get a moving shot. Uh, but this is done in such a way that the, uh, they calculated that if they were to actually to try and do it kind of live, they had the camera on a dolly and moving it there, the, the camera would have to move at, I think it was two or three hundred miles an hour and shoot at 250 frames per second just to get the, it's essentially one and a half seconds of action that are spread out over a 30 second shot. And yeah, that's not really practical. Also the choreography of the timing of everybody, all the stunt actors that need to be blown away by the explosion and jump through glass and whatever the heck stunt actors need to do. Yeah, the actual timing on all of them to get that right would have to be accurate to literally hundreds of a second. There are, they, again, they worked it out. It's like, okay, if this actor jumped off the ground two hundredths of a second too late, he wouldn't even appear in the shot, which is just nuts. So the way they actually did it in the end was to get, I forget how many cameras, but a ridiculous amount of cameras, not not filming cameras, still cameras, taking photographs cameras. They set them up and they was like, they set up, they set them up kind of around the scene basically and filmed all of it in sections and kind of had all the cameras take lots and lots and lots of pictures. Basically, as things were going on, they'd trigger all the cameras to go off in a specific order. So rather than the dolly rig and the camera moving around, there was actually just like a big circle of cameras around the scene. These physical, you know, taking pictures cameras. Taking, you know, static pictures. Photomographs, as it were. And they took all lots of bits of that and then composited them all together. And yeah, it was like if you're if you're filming at 24 frames per second, and they were because it's film. That's how that's what film is played at. For every for every second of footage, uh, how far they have to they had to work out where the camera would be every 24th of a second, and then place one camera in that place, so that as it went round, the camera was exactly where a moving camera would be if you had the dolly rig. So, the, so yeah, the. It, when you when you take the individual frames and play them back, it looks like that's it. That's I got anything to break those with? I do, don't I? 
Uh, it, it looks like it is on a dolly rig, but it's not. I totally missed that. Hooray, let's try this again. We don't have too many shots here. Boom. Okay. And the other one. Boom. Nothing worth my while. I ain't going in there. Always good to find out what you're going to get before you go in there. That's always fun. Yeah, so that was a very, very impressive scene. Um, that's the only scene I've seen of the movie. I've not seen the movie, but yeah, that was a super impressive scene. And then I imagine even even with the photos, that's not enough because, as I say, just the timing on it's ridiculous. So the amount of editing in post, some, some poor bloody video editor somewhere had a really horrible day, I think, putting that together. Just taking, like, it's probably, like, dozens of photos for every frame of the process and then compositing all the different things together. So they'll get like, I, I think ideally when they when they set out to film it, again, reading up on it, I've done a bit of reading up on it, it's like when they, when they set out to, when they set out to film the scene, they were like, oh, we'll do seven stuntmen at once. No, when it came down to it, they, they, they couldn't get that to work. They they just did one stuntman at a time. This is a scene with, like, police riot squads and everything everywhere. And there's loads of people in the scene. So every stuntman had to be done individually. So someone's had to then composite all those stuntmen together in the scene. All the things going on. Uh, sort of bullets and explosions and debris flying everywhere. And... Yeah, just to, just to play it back, it's really, it's visually, just, just just to look at it, you're like, ooh, how did they do that? Because the camera, if it were on a dolly rig, the camera would physically move through the window, one window of a car and out the other side, and, like, through the wall of a building and stuff, and it's like, how did they do that? What they did is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of static cameras, which is a really neat thing. Uh, additionally, also, if you ever want to look up uh, Weird Al Yankovic's Word Crimes, it's kind of a kinetic typography video, and it's obviously not a movie, which we were talking about, but whatever. Uh, yeah, look up look up the making of. The guy who makes it, he's credited in the video, so you can find out who it is. I forget his name offhand, but look him up. Um, Jarrett Heather, in fact, is his name. I remember it's Jarrett Heather. Look up how he made that, just because just the sheer attention to detail in that video is absolutely kick-ass. Um, yeah, you should go check that out. Uh, I'm not going to talk to Basil, because Basil has broken things far too many times for me lately, so I'm not going to talk to him anymore. I'm not, we're, not on, we're not on speaking terms, me and Basil, so I'll leave that there for now. So I should, please uh, leave me more questions. More questions are always appreciated. Uh, I still actually... I think I think I've still yeah I still didn't get through most of the ones from this week so I got a few for next week but yeah more always appreciated so please send them my way and I will answer them and that will be awesome so yes for now thank you very much for watching I've been Morocco this has been Spiral Spiel and I will see you next time. Bye.